The reading is from Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, What ought all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go, your faith has made you well. Thank you, Reg. When I was growing up, it was instilled in me by my mum and dad that you always say thank you for having me when you go around someone's house, for example. And since becoming a local preacher, I found that I even say it at the end of services as I stand at the door and say goodbye to the congregation as they leave. Thank you for having me in your church today. Writing thank you letters is also something I still sometimes do, as does my daughter. I have to admit, at 14, she um, does moan about it quite a lot, okay? But even, you know, she still has to write thank you letters um, for birthday and for Christmas presents because it is nice to tell a person that they are appreciated, isn't it? It is nice to acknowledge that a person has done something or said something or given something that has been appreciated. And not only is it nice for the receiver to say thank you, it is just as nice for the one who has given to know that their gift or hospitality has been acknowledged. And saying thank you is one of the basic rules of good manners in our society. And of course, it is an integral part of the scripture reading in Luke 17, verses 11 to 19, Jesus healing the 10 lepers. Because after encountering the 10 lepers who implore Jesus to help them, he sends them to present themselves to the priest because it was the priest that had to pronounce them cleansed and fit for a return to normal life. But despite this healing, only one of the men return to say thank you. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Prayers of praise and thanksgiving are an important part of our services and our private prayer time, those times when we acknowledge God for who he is and express our love for him, and those times when we focus on all he has given us or bestowed on us in our lives. And just as Jesus said to the leper in verse 19, after he has returned to say thank you, rise and go, your faith has made you well. It is our faith, our faith, which is strengthened and emboldened when we say thank you to the Lord for how he has answered our prayers. Because we are seeing and we are acknowledging the work of the Lord in our lives. Now saying thank you and cultivating a habit of gratitude and love is at the very heart of our faith. But it's also the care and compassion that we receive from Jesus that we need to give to others in turn. And so this morning, I want to look beyond gratitude and our need to take the time to praise and thank the Lord for all that he's done for us and to think about this passage in a bit of a different way. 
When I was asked to give my theme for today's service, I gave the theme, the milk of human kindness. And this saying comes from Shakespeare's Macbeth. And it is Lady Macbeth who says to her husband, yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. And basically, Lady Macbeth is saying here that her husband is not ruthless enough to achieve his ambitions. His ambition is to be King of Scotland. And the only way to achieve that is to kill Duncan, the current King of Scotland. But Macbeth, according to his wife, is too full of the milk of human kindness to do this. And according to the internet, the phrase now, the milk of human kindness, has generally come to mean compassion and care for others, maybe mercy or even sym sympathy. So basically, Macbeth is just too nice. And there's a great deal of the milk of human kindness in the scripture reading. There is a great deal of care, compassion, and mercy. And so this morning, I want to explore what I think we can learn from this passage as to how we can show the milk of human kindness today. First of all, I want to take you back to pre-COVID, when we could travel abroad a lot easier than we can now. The last holiday abroad that we took as a family, myself, Ian, and my daughter, Erin, was to Disneyland uh, Paris in the February half term before it all really began in this country anyway. We went by the tunnel from Dover to Calais because I get very sick on boats. And I can remember driving up to passport control and seeing men patrolling the border, probably with guns. I didn't look too closely so that they could make sure that no one was crossing the border that shouldn't be crossing the border. Borders can be exciting places, the gateway to a new country with new cities to explore and different people to meet. But as we know from the news in Afghanistan, they can also be places of loneliness, of terror and of fear. And the scripture this morning opens with the words, now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus travelled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Now, this border represented 500 years of hatred. The Jewish people's hatred, distrust and absolute disgust for the Samaritans, the people of Samaria, went back hundreds and hundreds of years and the people of Samaria felt the same. Bit of Bible history here. As a result of Assyria conquering Israel in 722 BC, Israel was split between the northern kingdom, with their capital being Samaria, hence Samaritans, and then the southern kingdom, which was ruled by Jerusalem. So Gentiles, so non-Jews, had been brought in to resettle, resettle the northern land. And so with these Gentiles came their pagan ways and gods. And the Jews remaining in Samaria began to mix with the Gentiles. And to the Jews still living in the southern kingdom, who had kept to their old Jewish ways throughout, this was an absolute no-no. Hence, 500 years of infighting and refusal to accept each other. Despite this border, however, Jesus travelled the border. We don't know why he did. Perhaps it was the quickest way to get from Galilee to Jerusalem. But even so, Jesus took a considerable risk in going this way. But 500 years of hatred and division was not going to stop Jesus. Not then, and certainly not through his death on the cross and resurrection. And the salvation that is for everyone, Jew and Gentile alike. Galatians 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, 
nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. But the question I want to ask you this morning is, do you ever feel called to walk the borders? I don't necessarily mean the borders between warring countries, but the borders between people, the borders between attitudes, opinions, politics, race, gender, sexuality, disability, all those ways that divide us as people because we know that we live in a divided world, that we live in a world full of borders. And it is the care and the compassion that we receive from Jesus that we in turn need to offer to everyone our milk of human kindness, as it were. So when we get to the borders, what do we need to do? We need to be even more like Jesus because he shows us that it is not enough to just walk the borders. It is what we do when we get there, when we are there and we are asked to share the living word. In one of his daily Facebook reflections this week, Andy Chislett MacDonald, our superintendent, said that it all starts with a single act of compassion. And we see this in verses 12 to 14. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus didn't ignore the lepers like most people would have. Most people would never even have seen them because they lived on the border as social outcasts. But because Jesus was there walking the border, he was able to stop, he was able to listen to them, and he was able to heal them. He was able to show them the saving grace of God. He didn't judge, he didn't run away in fear or recoil in horror, and we must do the same. We must stop, we must listen, and we have to help heal our divided world. How will the world out there, living on the borders of our differences in society, come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ if we're not out there walking the borders and sharing the message that despite our differences, we are all one in Christ. And what might be the result if we can do this? Well, someone, as we saw in the scripture, might come back and say thank you. And even better, they may ask to find out more about the living word, Jesus Christ, the saviour of our world. It might not be that person you expect, though. In Jesus' case, it was the foreigner, verse 18, the person that was so diametrically opposed to the way he had been brought up as a Jew, the person that history had told him was to be hated. It was the foreigner that had reached across the border to Jesus in asking to be healed. And Jesus had met him there with care, compassion, and mercy, the milk of human kindness.